It's a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this uh, opportunity to speak to you. Um, the theme of the conference is one that is close to my heart and especially in the academic context. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the inner life, shaping the inner world, shaping our inner world. I'm going to be saying a few things which may startle you and perhaps offend you, and if so, I'm asking forgiveness ahead of time. But the issues are very deep and very important, and I want to address them as forthrightly and as strongly as I can. I would begin with some words from Paul. You will remember in 1 Corinthians 1, 24, he uses the language, but to those who believe Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then again in Colossians 2, 3, for in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. And sometimes when we read the scripture, it's helpful to pay attention to the little trivial grammatical points and to ask ourselves questions like all the wisdom, all the treasures, how many does that leave out? How many are left out? And for example, looking ahead now and trying to prime your thinking about your own field. How much would you say there is in your own field that Jesus Christ does not know? You see, we have to reposition him very firmly for our work. And if we speak of following Christ, we can only follow Christ where he is. And if he's not ahead of us in our field, we can't follow him in our field. And so when we speak of shaping our inner world now, we're going to have to come to deal with some of the deepest ideas and beliefs and ways of thinking about things that we have, so deep that we may not even have identified them as such. The mark of our real beliefs and of our culture is that we don't even identify them. They just seem like part of the furniture. But if we're going to follow Christ in the academic context, we have to see him as one who is already there, who is out ahead of us, who knows what we need to know, who understands what we don't understand. And we have to also understand that he, in that context, offers us the fullness of his life, the absolute paragon and image of all goodness and all rightness. And in the context in which we live and work, he says to us, in those respects, follow me. 1 Corinthians 13, Matthew 5, Colossians 3, all of those great high points in Scripture that spell out the character of Jesus Christ. That is for us. Now, with that just brief introduction, I want to begin the body of what I have to say by recalling some of the language that was provided by those who set up this conference. And this is in some of your material that you've received. In some of that material, it is stated that, quote, scholars such as George Marsden, Mark Knoll, Mark Schwinn and others have described a vast gulf separating Christianity from the intellectual and ideological life of North America, of North American culture, and particularly from North American higher education. This gulf, I'm continuing to quote, this gulf has contributed to the profound gap between the personal life of Christian scholars and the professional and intellectual work that they perform. I want to address that gap. Quoting Mark Knoll, modern American evangelicals have largely abandoned the universities and the arts and the other realms of high culture. 
Continuing with the language, modern, th this void in the public square is echoed by a deeply personal one in the lives of graduate and professional students pursuing advanced degrees without a vital community of peers to challenge and encourage them. Many Christian graduate and professional students experience isolation and loneliness and when their academic life becomes sharply separated from their spiritual pursuits. See that gulf again? Their academic life becomes sharply separated from their spiritual pursuits. Their Christian faith is at risk. There's a problem, isn't there? It has many aspects, not least the problems that are created by the fact that the university and college system is now the authority center of our culture. That means that people tend to automatically accept what comes out of it without really examining it. And sometimes it is terribly mistaken in what comes out of it. It can be vastly wrong. And so we must understand carefully what is at issue here. The deep division that is addressed by these words between intellectual, artistic, academic, and the faith in Jesus Christ that really has formed the traditions of Western culture, including education, that gap, that deep division in life, is a matter of what is recognized as knowledge in our culture. The primary problem derives from the fact that the content of Christian teaching is not regarded as a body of knowledge. And you may be shocked to even hear someone raise that as an issue. It may be that your feelings and your thoughts and your habits are, well, of course it is not knowledge, it's faith. But if you say that, you have touched in your own soul the root of the division which is deplored in the words that we've just read. The idea that these are different worlds. The problem with which this conference is concerned is not something peripheral to the academic and intellectual situation of our day. It has to do with the coarse content that is regarded as acceptable in our colleges and universities and with what is regarded as appropriate research programs and methods of knowledge. The very root of our difficulty is that a world without God has been allowed to define what counts as knowledge. And what we must understand is that if we would shape our world, if we would follow Christ, not just in the university setting, but in any setting today, we have to meet our world with a challenge to the content of courses that are taught throughout our academic system, whether it's in secular schools or in sacred schools uh, as that language is used. We have to understand that we cannot overcome the gap by being better persons alone. We cannot overcome the gap by being more spiritual alone. In fact, it is the attack on the content of the Christian tradition as a knowledge tradition that undermines our ability 
to be better persons and to even have solid moral guidance. More on that in a moment. For two or more centuries, Christianity has been on the defensive intellectually. It has been deemed by many to have lost. And this is not a new story. Max Mueller, a distinguished uh, scholar of the last century, in 1878, had this to say. Every day it is announced from the most widely read journals that the time for religion is past, that faith is a hallucination or an infantile disease, that the gods have at last been found out and exploded. Diogenes Allen, in his book, Christian Belief in a Postmodern World, comments that subject after subject is studied in our universities without reference to God, so that anyone educated outside the church, schools, or college is given the impression that religious questions are not among the fundamental questions which any person who uses his or her head has to confront sooner or later. Well, that's the situation. Many people might even be surprised that one should raise it as an issue. But again, I say to you that that's just another indication of how fundamental it has become to our way of thinking. The very idea that uh, subjects in universities should not be taught without reference to God would be regarded as scandalous by many. My way of putting the point is to say that there's not a single field of thought or practice in our world today where knowledge of God is regarded as essential to competence. And one might say, well, there is one, the ministry, but I would challenge you to think on that because, in fact, there are some circles in which you could even say that it is a qualification for ministry to maintain that knowledge of God is impossible. And I can give you quotations and sources afterwards if you'd like to go into that. Now, what I need to say to you very simply to begin with is this. This is a, not a problem that lies outside of us as a Christian community of scholars. It lies within us. Uh, it does that because of the way we've been trained. Uh, we are, have been trained in a methodology that leaves God out entirely and does not make knowledge of God relevant to our competence as teachers. We are now products of that system. We have learned to think of our own image in this way. We regard ourselves, our respect as scholars, as those who are prepared to pursue our own field without any reference to the knowledge of God. Yet, even though that is within us, I agree with David Gill, quoted also on the face of the brochure that announced this conference. Uh, he says, I am thoroughly convinced it is not only biblically mandated, but really possible for Christians studying in secular universities and working in a pluralistic world to develop unified Christian perspectives, and now please note, on their fields. And then to think, work, and live as veritable salt and light in the midst of that world. And I believe that is possible. But it is really possible only if we understand the transformation of our own inner life, beginning with our most basic ideas about what counts as reality and what counts as knowledge, coming down to further points like developing an epistemology of the Bible as a way of knowing God, coming on down to the very concrete details of our own fields, and knowing the presence of Christ in those fields. But we have to be transformed. You see, if you ask 
almost any person who is the most brilliant person in their field, you will rarely ever hear anyone say, it is Jesus himself. Who is the greatest mathematician that ever lived? Who is the greatest economist? Who is the greatest philosopher? If you ask in general who is the smartest man that ever lived, you will rarely get, well, it's Jesus Christ, except perhaps from some child in Sunday school who has been told that Jesus is the greatest person in every respect. Now, you see, that goes to the heart of our thinking. And in fact, if you raise the issue of Jesus' intelligence, you may be thought to be joking. And yet, the same person who thinks this is somehow out of place, an oxymoron, and I've had Christians say that to me gently, to speak of Jesus as intelligent is an oxymoron. If you think that way, what can your discipleship to him mean? If Jesus is truly Lord, how dumb do you think he could be? You see, we have a problem of adjusting our inner perception of Jesus. And unless we can make the shift to where we take him seriously and regard his teachings about reality as fundamental truths which will stand up in the arena where we work, whether it's physics or New Testament theology or whatever it may be, if we cannot think of ourselves as living in that area with him, then we are unable to be his disciples and to look to him and to trust him and we park him at the door. And by contrast, I like to think of Jesus as someone who's perfectly at home in any professional context that you can imagine. In fact, he would greatly improve on most of them not just by his knowledge, but by his spirit. The disconnections which we suffer from run very deep. They run from a view of the universe as a universe of random, impersonal, pointless action of material objects. That's accepted. You can say that and no one will think there's something wrong with you in your professional context. Don't worry about whether or not it's true. You see, that view is authoritative. That view underlies the idea that God is irrelevant to any field of professional competence. Jesus Christ did not believe in that view of the universe. Now obviously, we don't do our work simply by quoting him as an authority. We do our work by asking him to stand with us in our work. As we stand for a universe that is ultimately Trinitarian at the bottom, personal, purposeful, the kingdom of God. The former view, random, impersonal, pointless, is the reality of academic culture. The latter is the reality of Christian revelation. They cannot coexist in the same mind. And one of the reasons why in the academic world many Christians have a constant struggle of faith is because they are taking too seriously the random, impersonal, pointless view of the universe as an authoritative position. And they do not stand confidently with the knowledge that a universe as Trinitarian, as personal, as purposeful, as creative, as full of freedom and beauty is a reality. 
And that's the kind of position we must change. Very quickly, I have four points that I want to talk about as the way back. And I've gotten uh, cleared by the authorities to go a little past my 11 o'clock time. So um, I'll have a few more minutes. What is the way back? This is perhaps the most contentious thing I will say to you. I've already said it. I want to say it again. And if you carry one thing away with you, I hope it will be this. In the renewing of our inner world, we have to understand our ideas and our beliefs must integrate with the fact that the central content of the Christian tradition is a tradition of knowledge. It's not a tradition of wild leaps and blind guesses. We know about God. We know it on the basis of reality that has been experienced and lived with and tested. When you think of the Apostles' Creed, do you think of it as a body of knowledge? I challenge you to try it on. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. What are we doing when we say that? I knew a, a, a psychological counselor in Madison, Stan, when we were there, who prescribed to some of his patients to go to the large congregational church that was there on the corner just for the benefit of standing with them and confessing the psychological benefit. And many people are tempted to think, even Christians to think, well, it's good for us to say this, and it is. But when we speak of renewing the inner person in such a way that we can talk about following Christ in our world and shaping that world, because we are inwardly reformed, we're talking about people who, when they say this, recognize that they are making a statement of what is the case on an appropriate basis of experience and thought. And I give you that as a simple description of knowledge. You have knowledge of something when you can represent it as it is on an appropriate basis of experience and thought. And what we stand for as Christians in the central creedal tradition of Christianity, what C.S. Lewis used to call mere Christianity, the center of the teaching is the most important knowledge the human race has ever touched. It's given to us. And it competes in any context. An old English philosopher that has much to say, L.T. Hobhouse, used to say, all that religion requires of philosophy is a fair field and no quarter given. And that's where we stand. And we stand here and we must affirm this. It must be something that we in our hearts have settled, that when we express the central truths of the Christian faith, we are standing on a solid basis which competes in any context. And then as we do our work, we want to work with that sense of the centrality of our knowledge of reality in the context where we live. I want to say something now that I'm, I, I'm cautious about saying because I know that I'm addressing uh, an issue that people have taken sides on. There is a view about Christian scholarship that Christian scholarship is, Chris, is scholarship done by Christians. Christian scholarship is scholarship done by Christians. And uh, 
If I may put it humorously, I think that's no more true than Christian pies are pies made by Christians. Christian scholarship can be very unchristian. If you mean by Christian scholarship, scholarship done by Christians. Christian scholarship is scholarship, I believe, that is appropriately informed by confidence in the truth of the basic Christian teachings. Now, we live in an atmosphere where it is sometimes hard to sustain that. And indeed, here we begin to touch over on the other side of the inner transformation of our world. Because in order to follow Christ in our world, in order to shape our world, we have to be people of virtue, of courage, of temperance, of wisdom, of justice, the great four cardinal virtues of classical thought. But we know we cannot live by those alone. By the time the Christian church had come along, it had been effectively proven that those great virtues could not support themselves. They had to be based in the Christian theological virtues of faith and hope and love. But you see, as we come to follow Christ and we hear the message of the gospel, he then calls us and shows us the way into the inner transformation where we stand with faith and hope and love. And that gives us courage and temperance and wisdom and justice because it plants us firmly in the reality of the triune God which stands at the foundation of the universe. And we must stand courageously knowing that nothing has been found out that refutes the tradition of knowledge in which we stand. I want to say that again because, you see, there's such a widespread idea that somehow, somewhere, someone has found that there is no God the Father. And you find it scattered through the literature. And you read your Freud and you read your Marx and you read your Nietzsche and you read your whoever. And there's often expressly stated that someone has shown that all of the religious beliefs were true. Read Freud's The Future of an Illusion, and you'll find a lovely illustration of that. I don't have time to quote from it this morning. But just read that and see how he will just offhandedly state, well, all of this has been shown wrong. Now, when you hear that said, or when that sense is there, I encourage you, with the courage of Christ, and with the love of Christ to say gently, where, how, when, let's look at it. Let's see if this is really so. You see, what has been created is a, an atmosphere. It isn't that, as Butler said long ago, someone has found out, Christianity has been found out. It isn't that what is stated by Christ and in his tradition of teaching has been shown wrong. Not at all. And again, if you're troubled with that, let's talk about it. I'll be glad to try to say what I can that would be helpful on this point. But we have to understand that what has happened with the passage of time is that an atmosphere has been created. Decisions have been taken. When William Graham Sumner in the 1890s made the statement to Noah Porter that God had nothing to do with the subject matter of political science, he was not announcing a discovery. He was announcing a decision. And that decision was made in an atmosphere that was being negotiated. There's a quotation in Brideshead Revis Revisited that so beautifully expresses this atmosphere that we have to deal with. Charles Ryder says, Sebastian's faith, Sebastian was the Catholic uh, 
believer in the book, as you may know. Sebastian's faith was an enigma to me at the time, not one which I felt particularly concerned to solve. The view implicit in my education was that the basic narrative of Christianity had long been exposed as a myth. Notice he said, this is so well done. Evelyn Waugh knew exactly what he was after. The view implicit in my education. Implicit, not explicit. You know, the strongest arguments are the ones you don't even have to state. They are the ones that carry things. You don't even state them. And then you embarrass people who want to raise them. That's the way the atmosphere works. And what we want to do is to understand what is happening there. Christianity has long been exposed as a myth. That opinion was now divided as to whether its ethical teaching was of present value, a division on which the main, in the main weight went against it. Religion was a hobby that some people professed and others not. At the best, it was slightly ornamental. At the worst, it was the province of complexes and inhibitions and of the intolerance, hypocrisy, and sheer stupidity attributed to it for centuries. No one had ever suggested to me that these quaint observances expressed a coherent philosophical system and intransigent historical claims, nor had they done so, would I have been much interested. That quotation captures the atmosphere in which we live. And we have to recognize it as an atmosphere, not as an argument, as an attitude, as a decision, not as some expression of insight into reality. Now, if we do that, and we're able to put all of the gods of naturalism and scientism and so on in their appropriate place, I'm not attacking science, but scientism is not science. Naturalism is not science. They're philosophical views that try to party up to science to gain authority for general views that you will never find in a scientific treatise as an established or even near established result. And they're a part of that atmosphere. Now, if we are clear about that, then we're able to turn to the other side and understand moral reality for what it is. Moral reality uh, is, again, almost an oxymoron in our time. One of the leading thinkers in ethical theory in recent years, J.L. Mackey's whole theory is, well, of course, moral statements express things that are supposed to be true. They're just all false because there is no morality to which they correspond. Now, when we have understood the truth that we're teaching, we have a basis in reality for moral teaching. One way of characterizing the moral situation in our time is that we try to have moral principles with no foundation in reality. And that's why they don't work. And that's why, basically, we wind up where the only correctness that is left is some kind of political correctness because we have robbed reality, we have robbed truth, we have robbed knowledge of everything that would support and provide a moral basis, or a basis for the moral life. But when we stand in Christ, we hear him calling us to love. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, if I give my body to be burned, if I know all mysteries and have all faith and have not love, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. You said it. But the people who sing it don't know what they're talking about. It is in Christ and the reality of a Trinitarian universe that we begin to understand the significance of real morality. And we begin to see virtue for what it is in the person of Christ. And as we follow Christ, he shapes our inner world. Unfortunately, this too is often missing from our Christian teachings. And we have a Christ who is interested either in making sure that we make the cut when we die or liberation. And of course, he's interested in both of those and both of those are very important. 
But if we aren't careful, we wind up with a gospel which leaves our inner life untouched and merely makes sure that we have the right marking somehow, the right brand, so that we'll, it'll be clear which herd we belong to. But Christ comes to us and says to us, let me transform you inside. Let me take all of those fears, all of those angers, all of that contempt, all of that lust that eats at your soul, and replace it with a worship of God and a love of others that will make your entire life sweet and strong because you will be standing with me in the kingdom of God. And he teaches us by saying, follow me. And the great challenge that we face today is to make sense of that idea of following Christ. Do you know that we live in a world in which it is now accepted that in order to be a Christian, you do not have to be a disciple of Jesus? That you can be a Christian until you die and never be a disciple. We have to make sense of discipleship to Jesus not just in terms of our beliefs, but in terms of our practices. You see, as a disciple of Jesus, I am learning from him how to lead my life as he would lead my life if he were I. I am learning from him how to live in the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what I'm learning to do. And I'm learning to stand in his love and freedom, in his hope, in his faith, so that my insides become differently. And I don't have time to say much about it, but the area of spiritual disciplines now is what opens up here. Spiritual disciplines are what you think about when you get serious about changing. When you decide, yes, I really would like to be the disciple of Jesus in every aspect of my life. I would like to be able to follow him, and I would like to learn from him how to have my fear my anxiety, my busyness, my loneliness transformed so that I am within a different person. And then if you learn to practice solitude and silence, uh, one of my own disciplines that I use constantly is scripture memorization. It is, there's no use to have a lot of scripture in the Bible and none in my head and to memorize scripture so that it is before me. Fasting, service, prayer. These are the ways in which we can actually take the person of Christ into us. And then we're able to stand in the world where we live, not only in the knowledge of Christ, but in the character of Christ. You know, when things begin to change, we occasionally see a great blessing of God right around us. It's often something that we think, I'm not sure I had anything to do with it, but it does happen. And one of the high moments of my life in recent years has been when a colleague of 30 years at lunch the other day off the top of his head, off the top of his head said to me, you know, I've come from being a confirmed atheist to being a devout Christian. Now he quickly added, well, you might not think it was devout because he knows, of course, the sorts of things that I do and am, uh, but I know that he really deeply meant what he said. And I had watched his journey and what had happened to this man who had gone the standard academic route that we all know and love, rightly, uh, he had been impressed with the secularist outlook and he had lived for years becoming increasingly concerned about it and finally had turned, partly through the reading of Kierkegaard and some other philosophers, had turned to look at Christ and as he looked, his heart was one. 
That happens. That's not what I'm there for, as Stan said. I don't make that the top of my agenda, but I pray for it. And I watch for it, and I try to speak the truth, and I try to do my work in such a way that the knowledge of Christ and the character of Christ will at least be available. What does it mean today in our setting when we look at, back at words like Fanny Crosby's old hymn, Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave, weep o'er the erring ones, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. You might think, what does that look like when the perishing we're looking at are perhaps some of the most successful people in our professional fields? But I think what that verse tells us today is that we as Christian scholars must come together in the knowledge of Christ and in the character of Christ to integrate our own fields with the truth of Christianity. I think that we can do that. We have been bullied out of it by specialist knowledge which intimidated old ways of presenting it. And now we as specialists in our fields need to gather around Christ who is the smartest man in our field and follow him in shaping our professional worlds to reflect the shaping that he has done of our own hearts and our own minds. May God give us grace to be able to do that.